Good morning. Thank you all very much for being here with us today. My name is Carlos Carrillo. I'm the executive director of the South Florida chapter of the Associated General Contractors of America. And don't let the name fool you. We've got folks right now online from Orlando and Tampa who are joining us. So welcome to you folks. Thank you for being part of our safety community here. Um, I want to start off by thanking our sponsors. Um, I want to thank um, Milwaukee Tools. Milwaukee Tools has been a title sponsor of our safety sessions now for over a year. We're very grateful for them sponsoring us and allowing us to have all the tech and all the food here. So thank you to them. Um, I also want to thank our host, Kelly Cronenberg, whose offices we are broadcasting live from today. Kelly Cronenberg, also a big supporter of our safety program. Thank you to them. I want to thank the team from Styles for having hosted us for a long time. Uh, Ian is a member of our safety committee. Uh, Styles is a big part of what we do, not just within our safety community, but at AGC of South Florida throughout. Um, and yeah, so thank you all very much for, uh, for being here today. It's great to have such a fantastic live audience, along with those folks joining us via, via Zoom. So um, I feel as if we have been talking about OSHA's impending heat standards for a long time. So at least certainly it's been a year um, that everybody's been talking about this. I know from talking to, to my, roofing, my roofing expert here, um, they've, they've been watching this for a while. I know there's several states that already put these into practice, but here in Florida, it's a bit of a different animal. Um, so we've been talking about it for a year or more, but just a few weeks ago, President Biden included the heat standards in his remarks on climate change um, when he passes it, when he uh, announced his executive action on climate change. Uh, what does this mean for us? So to answer this question, uh, we invited AGC of America's OSHA whisperer. Uh, and that would be Kevin Cannon. Kevin is AGC of America's Senior Director for Safety and Health Services. He is a frequent guest of our second Wednesday safety sessions, and it's always a pleasure to have him here with us. Mr. Cannon, can you hear me? Loud and clear. Awesome, Kevin. Thanks for joining us, man. It's always good to have you here coming in live from D.C. Absolutely. Thanks for the uh, invitation, and. <clears throat> Pardon me. You're right. There's been a lot of activity um, around heat, um, you know, and it goes back to, I'd say, the uh, fall of last year. And sorry if I'm giving a history lesson to those who are already kind of in the know. But, you know, they started with the memorandum to the regional administrators uh, in September, increasing their focus on uh, heat related inspections. Um, they identified and I think all of you, you know, are aware of this by now. Um, 80 degree heat index trigger, which means that they would start to focus their enforcement efforts on ha high hazard industries and construction being one of those. Um, you know, I, I've kind of not heard much except for raw numbers as far as the number of inspections that have resulted from that memo. And then, um, you know, they started with an advanced notice of proposed rulemaking. And that's the very first step in the rulemaking process. And that was just a series of questions. And so we answered them. There were more than 100. We didn't answer all 100. You know, we just felt like, you know, those that would have the most uh, impact on what we do um, as far as, you know, how do we regulate by region? You know, how do we regulate smaller employers versus the larger employers? You know, what, uh, what are some of the uh, disparities as far as uh, exposures to heat? You know, and that um, process, you know, is underway. Um, as I understand it, they're currently um, looking at, you know, the comments that were received. Um, you know, what I'll say is the timing for notice of proposed rulemaking is uncertain at this point, given that, um, you know, right now they want to finalize the uh, healthcare COVID-19 permanent standard. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, you know, that's a priority right now, but I do believe their focus will shift to um, to the heat standard. And at that time, we'll get an idea as to how they plan to regulate heat. Um, but in the interim, they issued the National Emphasis Program on April 8th. Um, you know, we read through it and we identified, you know, I'd say a handful of concerns that we had with it. One, 
um, it really doesn't indicate what a contractor has to do to satisfy, you know, I'll say satisfy the curiosity of a compliance officer during an enforcement proceedings related to heat. You know, they label or list out about 10 criteria for the compliance officer to evaluate, you know, ranging from uh, do you have a written program to, you know, unlimited uh, uh, amounts of water to having a buddy system on hot days. Um, and so, you know, what is it that they're expecting? And so we communicated that to OSHA by way of a letter in early June. Um, I've shared that, uh, not to put Mr. Trusky, I heard his name called, uh, on the spot, but I shared that letter with Brian. And basically, you know, we kind of said this, you know, reads like regulatory text. However, there's no standard. So, you know, what are your expectations of us? Um, they had started working on a response to AGC, <clears throat> excuse me, laying out what their expectations are. Um, but then uh, during our safety and health conference, two, three weeks back, we had the opportunity to sit down with the assistant secretary and the deputy assistant secretary. And the primary focus of that meeting, you know, there, it was a host of topics, but the primary focus was on the heat NEP. And um, they understood the confusion that's out there. I think one of the biggest things is the inconsistent um, approach to enforcing um, the NEP uh, across the various regions and area offices and whatnot. I'm not for certain what you've heard um, from your local OSHA folks, but you know, I've heard anything from we're going to evaluate all 10 items to, you know, if you're doing, you know, the basics of water rest shade, um, you know, we, we find it difficult or we, 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 we see it as a challenge as far as issuing a general duty clause citation that will be upheld. Um, so, you know, I think that has, um, you know, caused them to think they appreciated the uh, uh, frank discussion and the issues that were raised. You know, one of the biggest things that they focus on now is acclimatization, right? And in the NEP, it is, I think, identified 12 times or the word is used 12 times, but only in the hazard alert letter do they give you any um, sort of details as to what they mean by acclimatization. And they look at it from two perspectives, you know, the new worker and the returning worker. New workers, um, you know, 20%, <clears throat> excuse me, of the workload for seven to 14 days. Returning workers, which is those, which are those who have been away from the job three days or more, return at 50% of the workload for uh, three days or more. And so, um, you know, one of the things we did find is that they they may not have read the NEP in great detail to understand some of these uh, issues that we were raising. Um, so they've gone back. Um, they've indicated that they are going to make some adjustments to the NEP. I don't know what those adjustments are. I don't know if, well, they're going to make some adjustments. And I don't know if they're going to, you know, update or revise the NEP to, um, you know, address the concerns that were raised or they'll issue a separate memo, but we understand there is some type of response in the works. I mean, you know, I think they appreciated what we, um, you know, how we raised it, you know, in a very firm, but, you know, respectful tone. And so the day after they pulled the team together and sat down to discuss. And, you know, what I would say is if we did not present valid arguments, um, they would not have, you know, it would have been dismissed. They would not have, uh, uh, taking the time to meet and discuss these issues. So not certain where it's going to go, but I understand that, you know, we do have a response in the works. So, you know, in the meantime, you know, I, I, you know one of the things we kind of wrestled with was putting together a plan. Um, and, you know, the decision not to put out a plan was based on the fact that, you know, there's not a threshold for compliance identified by OSHAN. So, you know, as much as we want to be a resource, the last thing we want to do is to put out a plan for, you know, members to adopt. And then, you know, you have a compliance officer who, who feels like it's not, you know, uh, sufficient um, in reducing heat related hazards. And we have members that receive citations. So once we get a response from them, as far as their expectations, we can build a plan and share it with the members. But I know, you know, being in South Florida, many of you already addressing heat, you know, it, it didn't just, 
uh, become an issue, you know, in the fall of 2021 when they issued that um, uh, memo to the regional administrators. It's, all, it's been something that we've been addressing, you know, since the sun come up, you know, that's what I tell them. Um, so, you know, it, it's really trying to figure out what it is that you're hearing from your local OSHA folks as far as their expectations. And that would be helpful to us, um, especially if you've you know been on the receiving end of any enforcement proceeding, but that would be helpful to us and communicate back to the OSHA folks. Um, you know, that's what it is, Carlos. As far as the uh, rulemaking is concerned, I would say, you know, we're several months out from seeing any type of regulatory framework. What they're gonna hang their hats on right now is the NEP, which will be in effect for three years. Um, and I doubt if they'll have a final rule out in the three years. So um, this is going to be how they enforce heat related hazards in construction. Um, I was asking if anybody wanted to share what was going on here with their local OSHA, uh, with our local OSHA office. And uh, like Kevin said, if you have any questions, please feel free. Cedric, they can just ask, right? The microphones pick up their questions. Perfect. So if you have a question, raise your hand, feel free to ask. I mean, you have an expert here on on the uh, on Zoom, so feel free to ask, please. Hey, Kevin. Yes. Did anything come about with the Supreme Court ruling on the environmental stuff on how they they can't just jump over and do the uh, make a standard on their own or law on their own and enforce it? Yeah, we talked about that a little bit. You know, the the impression I got from the OSHA folks is that. Um, it applies, but doesn't apply. And when I say doesn't apply, it doesn't really <laughs> apply in this instance as it relates to heat. You know, they feel confident that they are well within their you know, uh, jurisdiction, I'll call it, to issue a, a standard related to heat, just given, um, you know, the data that they're using to justify moving forward. Thank you. That, that was a great question. So, so even without a, a standard being written, can't they just fall back on like on, on, on a 5A1? That, that's exactly what they're using um, for this NEP. And that's what they've historically used. Um, but you have, um, you know, and again, this isn't really, um, this statement isn't to suggest that, you know, I disagree or agree, but you have labor, uh, labor groups, uh, worker advocacy groups and folks on the Hill who feel like um, the general duty clause is insufficient in enforcing heat related hazards, especially in um, in light of the uh, Sturgill roofing case. If you're not familiar with it, it was a case that was heard by the um, you know review commission. Um, there was a contractor, Sturgill Roofing. They had a gentleman who was a temporary uh, temporary worker on the job site for a day. And, um, you know, he passed away and they, uh, you know, uh, related that um, to that fatality, the heat. Uh, but the review commission and they issued a general duty clause citation and the review, <clears throat> pardon me, the review commission um, vacated that citation. Um, you know, one based on, you know, the methods that were used to calculate the heat index and whatnot. Um, but, you know, the bigger part was the fact that they said, you know, in this case, you can always say they did more, you know, they made water available, they had shade available. Um, you know, they checked on this gentleman frequently. Um, you know, what more in the absence of a standard did you expect? So that's why they're, you know, uh, uh, focused on issuing a standard. By, by the way, Kevin, it just, just for the education of our group, there was a bill submitted in the Florida legislature last year that had these heat standards. It didn't even get heard in its first committee, but this isn't just an effort that's being taken in Washington, D.C. at the federal level. It's also something we have to be cognizant of here. So, And that's that's what we do other than our safety programming. We're, we're very engaged in state government affairs, so we were able to head that off at the pass. And you know, there's also legislation introduced uh, at the federal level, um, one is uh, the uh, Asuncion. I can't remember the the entire um, uh, the entire name of the bill, but it you know the the first attempt was in 2019, and they reintroduced it, and it passed the House the week that we were um, having the uh, safety and health conference. But there's also another bill that's been introduced by 
um, you know, a representative out of Texas that would mandate, you know, 15 minute break, paid 15 minute breaks every four hours. So, you know, not only are the, uh, you know, is there, um, you know, efforts in the executive branch, you know, OSHA, uh, but also the legislative branch, Congress, to um, get OSHA to move forward on um, a heat standard. Is the health of the individual being taken into effect? Absolutely. That is what we raised um, with the assistant secretary and deputy assistant secretary is that, you know, there's so many things, you know, if you look at it, um, you know, there, there's a lot of, uh, you know, personal health um, issues that, you know, make an individual more susceptible to heat. Um, and there's also, you know, uh, personal lifestyle choices that makes individuals more susceptible to heat. You know, alcohol, um, poor diets. Um, um, you know, uh, yeah, I was just about to say that. You know, the example I used um, when I talk about it is the fact that you know, some mornings I stop at the little convenience store up the street. And, you know, I see, you name it, contractor, electrical, mechanical, whomever, and they're double fisting uh, energy drinks. And so, you know, that's, uh, you know, you, you have very limited control over that. And, you know, OSHA needs to take that into account, into consideration. So we have raised those um, concerns with them as well. And then, you know, you get to the issue of, you know, folks, uh, if you look at that NEP, um, you look at... Uh, the list of medications, you know, um, allergy meds, blood pressure meds. I mean, you know, these are uh, common medical conditions and, you know, you may or may not know. I mean, they do suggest that you educate your folks and say, hey, you know, consult with your doctor. But I mean, if I go to my doctor and he says, yeah, Kevin, um, you know, you're taking those blood pressure meds. We don't think you should be working out in the sun. Um, you know, am I going to communicate that back to my employer? i I'm, I'm doubtful that they will. So, so um, NIOSH came out with a 190 page document directed by the CDC and yes. from, uh, I guess, also from OSHA that when you, when you read this thing, you need to be a meteorologist, yep. a physicist, a doctor, yep. Yep. and, and also a safety professional at the same time. And it is, it is, at what point do we just do we have to have our subcontractors and our contractors actually come up with a, a heat related illness plan opposed to just having awareness and saying water rest shade and and educate the people in the field I totally agree you know that 2016 NIOSH document is uh, uh, a cause for significant concern um, in addition to all the things you mentioned, you know, they also have um, their work rest uh, table or regimen um, in there. And at some points, you know, you could be working, you know, 30 minutes on, 30 minutes off. Um, but in the more more extreme situations, you could be 15 minutes on and 45 minutes off. Um, so we are we, we have reviewed that document. Yes. And, you know, that legislation I mentioned they uh, referenced that NIOSH document, um, not certain how OSHA will take it into consideration as far as implementing any of those elements into a final rule. But yes, we have been watching that and you're absolutely correct, you know, to your point about, you know, being all these things um, to, to address the heat, you know, you had, <clears throat> pardon me, you had the area director in Houston um, that you know, pretty much said that um, he thought that, you know, having uh, someone on site with the ability to take blood pressure and uh, monitor core body temperatures was what he felt like was an appropriate uh, step for contractors to take. Um, and we raised that again with the folks here at the national office and they said time out. No, that's not what we're asking for. So um, you're right. And I think some folks, um, depending on where you are, have looked at, you know, either the um, ACGIH or the NIOSH document and have taken that um, and, and incorporated it into and I, and maybe official or unofficial communication to their compliance officers as to what they're um, expected to observe. And, you know, the one, the biggest thing I think is, you know, how do we um, accurately 
uh, calculate workload or exertion. You know, they use the uh, term exertional heat stress now. You know, how, uh, how will we, you know, you got, oh, yes, we can monitor the, uh, the uh, uh, you know, heat index, but, you know, how are we going to say, okay, it's 80 degree heat index and this individual is jackhammering or this individual is, um, you know, uh, you know, manually lifting uh, rebar, you, you name it. I mean, how are we going to factor that in and come up? Yeah, we're always going to be at odds, is my point, with the compliance officer. What you say is it's going to be at odds with what he thinks uh, the workload or exertional heat stress might be. Not to mention that there are so many variables involved. And in, even if you can isolate, say, one specific day saying this is this is we have a wet bulb thermometer and we've done all these things. But now you take it down to the actual individual and his, his, his physical uh, ability to do that job. It, it, just, um, it just seems like it's, uh, there's, there's just too many variables involved to narrow it down. Agreed, uh, agreed. And that, you know, and that was the point we tried to make in our letter, as well as in our discussions with them that, you know, it, it, you make it too complicated. Um, you know, we, folks are just gonna put their hands up and, you know, do nothing, or at least what they've been accustomed to is the water rest shade. Um, so you have to make it to where uh, folks understand, you know, what you're looking for. And, you know, as, you, as someone said, you know, um, you know our, our people are not, you know, uh, uh, doctors. They're not, you know, emergency medical techs. They're not, you know, meteorologists. So um, we all the concerns you're raising is are the same that we have raised with them. I think, again, the biggest thing is helping us understand what your local OSHA folks are saying, if they've said anything, um, you know, and, and uh, I've not had the opportunity to talk with anyone from, you know, Florida, but, you know, again, if you, you hear from reports from Ohio, you hear reports from Houston, um, you hear reports from Region 3, um, it's all different. Yes, sir. Region four did send out an email or uh, a notice on on July seventh, reminding everybody of the heat illness standards and the requirements. I don't know if you saw it. It was in the news release, the OSHA news releases. Um, they're definitely focused on it. That should be a precursor. The fact that California has already had this program for fifteen years. Uh, I mean, I'm sure they'll model it after California. Have you been hearing anything about that, Kevin? Uh, um, an existing plan that's not super complicated, but can be done. And for those who've worked in California, you had to do it. And they do come and check your program and they do actually come and investigate even before the season even starts to where you actually have to have the program. Uh, you're, you're right. Um, you know, California's had it in place for some time. Oregon got theirs last year because of the heat wave in the Northwest. Um, Washington's had one for some time. And Minnesota also has one. Um, and that legislation that I mentioned, it, I, I got to go back, but I know um, the previous uh, version um, indicated that OSHA should model their heat, any heat standard after what they consider to be the most stringent among the states. So California would be it. Um, the most reasonable out of the state plans, I think, would be Oregon. So, um, yeah. <laughs> I've not, and what I'll say also there are is the state plans that it, those that have standards and those that do not, even those that do not, are not obligated to um, adopt this NEP. Um, so it, we'll just have to wait and see, you know, where they go with the uh, with the proposal. You know, it could be very well modeled after um, the California standard. You know, uh, Mr. Parker is from California, so. Um, or the former head of uh, uh, Cal OSHA. So, you know, that wouldn't be um, out of the realm of uh, possibility. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Kevin, I think you freaked everybody out. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I, that, that's my job lately. You know, and, um, but, you know, <laughs> You know, please do if you, you know, Carlos, if you could share my contact information, if you um, are on the receiving end 
of any enforcement or you hear, you know, uh, inconsistent messages, you know, across the, the various um, area offices, please let us know. And that would be helpful um, for us, again, to, to follow up with the folks here in the national office, uh, specifically um, enforcement. So yeah, you, I was about to ask you what we can do to help, and there you go. So um, Kevin's in, contact information, I will share it with all of you, but it's also available online. He is extremely accessible. Um, Kevin, as always, thank you for being so giving of your time. We appreciate it. Yeah, well, as always, I appreciate uh, participating in your safety meetings and looking forward to the next one. When, when are you coming back? When are you bringing the, uh, the – the safety uh, safety event back down to South Florida. We want you back here in Fort Lauderdale or Miami. All right, we will relay that information to uh, Ms. Brittany and put her on the uh, on the hunt. Awesome. All right, thank you, Kevin. We appreciate you. Have a great day. Thank you. You too. Awesome. All right. Make sure you tell Kevin you come in the winter, not in the summer. Oh no, we don't need to tell him that. He's good. He's good. <laughs> All right. So, hey, what I'm going to do now, I want to thank everybody who is joining us online. Um, any Anything that you guys want to bring up for discussion before we get to presentation of the awards? Or presentation of the awards, excuse me. All right, cool. No problem. So thank you very much for joining us online. That's going to conclude our online portion of our second Wednesday safety session. We appreciate you all. Have a great day.